Road Atlanta's Speed Vision GT double header weekend left points leader Bobby Archer with a bitter taste after settling for third place in round four. Well, you know, the, the first race is really a heartbreaker. To lead 26 and a half laps of a 28 lap race, and, uh, you know, we had them covered, and everything was going great. The differential broke, and we ended up third. Race two would lead him down a similar road. Had great expectations for Sunday, and, you know, the race just didn't work at all. We broke another differential on Sunday morning. And then the fuel pump crapped out, you know, eight, ten laps into the race. For the first time this year, both the GT and touring cars race together. And while Archer and Galati will try to focus on the job at hand, they'll also have to deal with traffic on a very crowded track. We're going to get caught up in traffic, definitely. I mean, the, the leaders and, and the touring car, we're going to get up with the GT cars. It's going to be a bottle. I mean, we just got to try to stay out of trouble. I just hope that the traffic doesn't dictate the, you know, the outcome of the race. And it very well could. The Speed Vision GTN Touring Car Championships from Trois Rivières next. Welcome to our first combined Speed Vision World Challenge event of the season featuring the GT and touring cars running together as part and parcel of the 30th running of the legendary Grand Prix de Trois-Rivières. Hi everybody, I'm Greg Creamer along with Dorsey Schrader and John Bisignano. You're looking at the GT portion of the field. Of course, the touring cars will take up station in a separate start right behind them. And uh, this is going to be very interesting. The GT cars on this track, well, they're going to present a challenge. But one of the teams, one of the cars that's excelled is part of our manufacturer spotlight with Biz. Today in the spotlight is Peter Kitchak and his beautiful 911 RSR. Peter, let's get right to the heart of this car, the motor. This is an air-cooled, normally aspirated 3.8 liter Porsche motor. It's about 228 cubic inches. They're called air-cooled motors, but technically they're not that. Uh, the car has 16 quarts of oil. There are two oil coolers up in the front of the car, and the car is really cooled with the oil that circulated within it. Now what about the aerodynamics? The aerodynamics of the car are really almost identical to what you would buy if you bought a standard 911. Are the brakes standard? The brakes are standard. The brakes are a two caliper or a two piston caliper on each end, but they're all standard street car parts. Wheels look a little bit wider to me. Wheels are about one inch wider than um, the biggest of the Porsches. They're probably about two inches wider than most of the street Porsches that you would see. We really don't have to change much on these cars. We lighten them up a little bit. We put a roll cage in it and we go racing. Porsche loves to go full bore racing with minimum tweaks to their road design. Sports car racing in Porsche, pretty synonymous, really. Dorsey, let's take a look at this uh, track, and by all measure, one of the things to say is, as a driver, if you like it, it's a good track. You like this as we look at our Toyota track now. Well, the straightaways here are pretty long and pretty fast, so that's good for the GT cars, but the corners are very, very tight. It's hard on brakes here around this racetrack, and the touring cars are going to be really, really fast in those tight corners. They made some changes to turn one. What's your take on that? Well, they've opened up turn one, and they've allowed that to uh, go side by side and get two or three cars through there. Before it was pretty tight there. Now it's a lot safer, and I think it'd be good racing there. The Road Atlanta doubleheader weekend was for GT only, so they've got five races in the books, and Bobby Archer leads by five points over Cooper, Biscuit, Kitchen, and Chart. In Turing, for four races, Michael Galati having one all four, he leads 132 over Pierre Klein, who means 112, and Hugh Plum with 109 in third place. You can hear the engines coming to life on the starting grid, and again, they will have a split start, as they call it here. The GT cars, faster of the two classes, of course, will start first. Pace car is starting to make its move, and the field will begin to roll off. And you can see a very interesting front row. We talked about the manufacturer diversity in the past few races, and it is playing out nicely here once again. This is one of our onboard shots. That's going to be number 22. That's George Biscop, and he's in the Control Solutions Porsche, currently third in the points. And here's Dave Shart, currently fifth in the points. And Dave, of course, is driving the 
uh, wheel source Toyota Supra Turbo. And again, that's that great manufacturer mix we're talking about. Yeah, I tend to believe what Bobby Archer said at the beginning of the show. I think traffic is going to be a, a big factor in today's race when you see all these race cars on a tight street circuit like this. Well, the touring cars, very agile, very quick, and they can run, uh, the, the front end of the touring cars can run with some of the slower GT cars, and that can uh, really get into class battles. It doesn't take them very long to get there either. <laughs> About three or four laps, they'll be into each other. Well, when we come back to Trois-Rivières, we'll bring you the starting lineup for both GT and touring. Welcome back to Trois-Rivières, and one of the major players in the GT division, even before we go green, is having problems. Well, Bill Cooper, who is second in the championship, his Corvette is in the pit lane. They are only running on five cylinders, but they want to get a couple points for just starting the event. He will go out after everyone has passed and try and keep it out there as long as possible. A long trip for just a little bit of running for Bill Cooper. Well, they continue to try and develop the new C5 vet, and in the meantime, running that C4. Dorsey, here's the touring car field as it's working its way around. We've talked about two different classes here. Basically, what's the distinction? Well, GT cars are faster cars. They have bigger motors, bigger tires. In essence, bigger car. You look at these touring cars, they're the smaller four-cylinders, most of them. Some of them have six, but they're not as fast in straight-line speed. However, corner speeds on these cars are probably faster than GTs. That should make the end of this race very interesting. Let's take a look at our BMW starting grid in the GT division for their sixth round. Archer on pole in the Viper Speed Viper. Kitchak alongside the Key Wade and Toad Hall Porsche. Row two is Biscup in the Control Solutions Porsche and Safar in the Tsunami Hidden Creek Vet. Row three, Diorio in the Danielson Ford Mustang and Halsmer in the Honda of America Acura NSX. Row number four, teammates Lackey and Bradley in the Corvettes of Houston Corvettes. Row number five is Shart in the Wheel Source Toyota Super Turbo and Brown in the HP Motorsports Mustang. Row number six is Fernando Le Blanc in the MCL Porsche and Peter Polly in the Polly Brother Cutlery Corvette. Row 7 is Pierre Barai in the Barai Motorsports Mustang and Oppenheimer in the Impact Toad Hall Racing Porsche. And row number 8 will be Bill Cooper in that Les Stanford Corvette struggling already and uh, Boisvert in the Grand and Toy Porsche. Let's take a look at the Turing grid for their fifth round. Galati on pole in the Duplicolor Redline DC Sports Acura. Kleinubing alongside in the Real-Time Racing Acura. Row 2 is DuPont in the European Racing Technologies BMW and Plum in the Team Real-Time Racing Acura. Turner will be next up in the HR Springs BMW, Charlie Downs in the Pepper Seed Racing BMW, Row 4, Rosenblum in the Inner City Youth Racing BMW, and Jason Potter in the Performance Motorsports Accord. Row 5 is Schrantz in the Real Time Acura, and Wade in the HR Springs BMW, Row 6, Ellinger in the RC Imports Benz, and Marks in the Pepper Seed Racing BMW. Row 7 is Tar in the HR Springs BMW, and Stewart in the HP Motorsports Entry. And as we take a look at the rest of the Turing grid, here comes the GT field around for their start, and Archer bringing them up nice and slow great formation and from that lugging kind of speed on the start you think the torque of that viper would pay off it looks like it did yeah he had a good start there look how wide turn one is that's halsmer out in the kitty litter he got stuck out there that didn't help him out any makes it through however and here they come streaming down toward the duplessis arch one of the real landmarks here in trois rivieres and there's the start for the touring category galati look at the fan out everybody gets through a couple of guys oh there's a little bump there and that's uh, charlie downs and jason potter the, the black bmw and honda cord running way wide but they make it three and four wide through there that's the new turn one charlie downs good save right there he got in the kid that got pushed out there and did not hit the wall and everybody streams through. Oh, there's an optimistic move. It made it. Everybody looks at it and gets through that narrow arch. And now here's the longest, fastest section of track course that comes up into the best braking and overtaking area. Uneven braking. Look at this. Oh, boy, good defensive move. Charlie Downs moves to the inside. Oh, barely got himself shut down. You don't want to go off there. There's a big barrier. If you go straight, you're going to hit really hard. And coming out of turn six, that's Galati and the white Acura chased hard right now by Kleinubing. And then a very strong running, Alfred DuPont running third. Then it is Hugh Plum and the rest of the field back up at the overall position. And look at this, Dave Sharp trying to get around the outside of Rick DiOrio. Boy, that's tough to do going into one. And boy, they still side by side. You could have never done that last year there. That whole turn one's wider now. He made that. Nope, he hasn't made it. That's Diorio on the outside right there in turn two. That was side by side all the way through one. Shart looks again, but that has allowed Paul Brown and the uh, Mustang right behind to close it up. And Diorio gets a pretty strong run. But look at the gap already. Archer in that blue Viper, then Kitchak. They've opened it up just a little bit over Biscop and then Safar. 
Yeah, Kitschek, I like the way that Porsche is handling. It looks pretty good through there, right behind him, Biscop as well. The longer it goes green, the more advantage it has to the Porsche. Of course, the uh, Viper, the big heavy car, it's going to play with brakes. It's going to play with tire temperature. Those Porsches, I think, will look good here today. Well, Porsche brakes are legendary. And look at the pressure Kitschak applying already to Bobby Archer. And here we go. This is turn nine. This is the slowest corner. It's the hairpin. And then it's up through a quick left right onto that front straight. Real tight through here. You get on this front straightaway, and it's really hard to get the power down. The Viper will be the first one to show that as we get further into the race. When he gets on that big old V10 there, it's going to turn the rear tires and you see the thing step out. A little bit of that overrun, that dark exhaust, that is no problem. That is how that Viper Speed team sets that car up, has done so all season long. And Key Wade and Toad Hall racer Kitchek, look at that wider line he takes through there, better exit speed. Yeah, he's getting a good run through there to get the run down the hill right here underneath the arch. Of course, here's the big uphill climb. That's to the Viper's advantage. But at the other end, the hard braking, the Porsche will probably get, get, get back what it loses right there on the climb. We've documented that during the Road Atlanta weekend. They came in, the Porsches did, with a little less tire. They had some tire taken away. It was given back for the second round. They still have it. That's got to be a huge advantage for them here on its tight street circuit. Well, it certainly made them competitive again. You know, they uh, they really suffered without that rear tire. The Porsche, of course, with the engine in the rear, needs uh, a pretty good tire back there to hold it all up. Streaming through turn number eight goes Archer, chased hard by Kitchak. There's Biscop. Behind him, Safar and Halsberg round out the top five, but strong battle right here at the front. And as you pointed out, Doris, you can see where each of these cars on the very sections of the track, their strong suits come into play. Yeah, look back there at Biscop's car, and it doesn't look anything near as stable as Kitschak's. Of course, more Porsches, but uh, Biscop's car sliding around, I think maybe his setup is a little bit off at the back. Through that wide part of turn one, we go back now to the Turing battle. There's Galati feeling the heat big time from number 42. That is Pierre Kleinhubing. And you can see they've already caught one of the GT cars, so traffic is coming into play as they head on to the front straight. And Galati, he's already won four in a row. He'd like to extend, that's a record. He'd like to extend that four, make it five in a row. And uh, Kleinhubing, of course, would like to blunt that. And look at that move as Hugh Plum has gotten around DuPont and has moved up into third, knifes by the lap traffic. DuPont got through as well. And next through is going to be Will Turner in that blue and yellow BMW. And uh, in a sense, both of the classes looking fairly similar at the front. The two lead cars have opened up a little margin and are really racing each other hard. Here is Plum in third. But they haven't yet caught up with the uh, the thick of the uh, other group. And when they do, I'm talking about the back markers in the GT Touring. Uh, the Touring guys are going to catch those GT guys. And when that happens, it's going to really change the outcome. Of the complexion might just be changing here in just a few minutes here at Trois-Rivières. The Speed Vision World Challenge Championship. Seaway and Trois-Rivières, Quebec. The battle in the GT division up front continues to be one of the Viper and the Porsche. And you can see behind, there is one of the lapped touring cars. So it works both ways. And uh, here comes Biscup, who is starting to work through that traffic in the Control Solutions. Porsche swings out hard under braking, going into turn eight, and knifes through. And it's just going to get worse from here on, I would suspect, George. Yeah, you get in those situations, and it costs you a couple tenths of a second. And, uh, it, go, it comes and goes all the way around the racetrack. We're on board with Klein. Be look, he's going for the lead up the inside of Galati. That's turn six. Whoa, but look at that. That car was not turning at all while it was locked up, was it? No, in fact, I, I don't know that they didn't hit, but boy, that was really close to a hit if it wasn't. Was that, that looked kind of like a last-minute decision maybe on Pierre's part. He realized he had a good run going. Well, you heard the motor quit. means he locked up the front tires. It's a front-wheel drive car, of course, and you heard the motor stop. So he was all the way locked up there for just a minute. So Kleinuming moves to the front, Galati second and uh, not exactly losing him at all. Let's take a look at it from outboard here. Dorsey, uh, you can see, boy, he came a uh, very aggressive move. Ooh. Look at the front wheels, you see, just that was a real good job of braking. Klein moving right there, did a perfect modulation. He just locked up a little bit and let the thing roll, and uh, it was a great pass. And he holds on to the lead, Galati second, and uh, amazingly, that really didn't have seemed to affect the gap back to third place, and that's Hugh Plum right there at this point. And Hugh Plum, he's got some experience and some success on street circuits. Acura has not lost a race in the Speed Vision Touring category since Minneapolis last year, and the driver who did that was Hugh Plum in a BMW. 
Of course, now Hugh Plum switches over and gets into the Acura. It's first time he's ever driven a front-wheel drive car. I think he's learning pretty quickly. And keep in mind, the guys that he's chasing are former teammates. Klein Newman and Glotti used to both race for real-time racing. They're both former champions in the category. And they are catching a very ill Les Stanford Corvette of Bill Cooper, who does a great job, immediately got far over to the left and let him stream by. This one, it gets frustrating to be a driver. You get caught behind those cars, and of course, they're racing too, but uh, you get caught back there, and it can uh, change the whole complexion of the race for you real quick. Boy, Galati got a great run through turn eight, but couldn't do anything with it. Now down into the hairpin, and they'll start that move up to that quick left-right flick that takes you onto the front straight. And uh, boy, Galati continues to apply some pressure here through turn 10 and onto the straight. Well, he wants to be in a position uh, to capitalize if he gets out, there's a slow car in front of him, and if it holds up uh, the car at all, you need to be there to try to stick your nose. He's trying to stick his nose in right now, as a matter of fact. So they sweep through one and a couple of different lines being used. And Make it a Galati just clipped the barrier, Dorsey, on the exit of turn two, and he's smoking. Oh, he hurt the car. Look at the right rear. Right rear's rubbing pretty bad there now. He could have bent the axle. The rear axles in those cars uh, aren't really that stiff, and it's pretty easy to bend one. And, boy, you know, that's the first mistake he's made all year, Greg. And what a time to do it. You can see there goes Plum streaming by, the smoke pouring off of the back of the car. And uh, he's... Look at that. There's DuPont and Turner both trying to take evasive, trying to find a way by. And as a result, DuPont got held up, and Turner swung through and picks up fourth. Yeah, Galati flat-sided that car. You can see right there. He's, uh, he's going to have to worry about whether or not that's going to cut that tire down because it's rubbing pretty good. Well, we heard Kleinubing uh, on the radio getting very upset with that Corvette in front, but it was Galati who paid the price. Here it is. Oh, just too far, too wide. He was out there in the marbles, couldn't get the car to turn, and he hit that wall pretty doggone hard. And immediately, I mean, it wasn't as if it took seconds even. It was immediate. That smoke started to come off the back, and uh, that has got to be great concern. Now we'll see what Galati can do at number 93, a quick loop by Jeff Tarr in the BMW, but he regains. We go back on board at the front now, and that is Peter Kitchak coming through turn 10, and oh, way to the wall. The outside should be able to get by here. Makes the pass. That's Marks in the white car over there. That uh, That's the traffic I was talking about. Of course, the leaders got trapped in that traffic right there and almost caused an accident. And Dorsey, as a result, Kitchak has taken the lead. Archer elected to go outside of Marks. Kitchak dove down the inside, and he got them both. Nice move by Peter Kitchak, your new overall and GT leader. This traffic plays into the hands of Kitchak. Of course, like you said at the beginning of the show, Porsche with the legendary brakes. Well, this is the place where you need a lot of brakes at the end of the straightaway. And Kitchak coming into turn six, and oh, look at that move! <laughs> oh my God, he just put it right through the middle. He threaded the needle there. That was close. That was Rick Ellinger in the BMW, and of course the wounded Bill Cooper and Kitchak knew he didn't want to have Archer get any run on him and lose momentum, and he just found a gap, and it was as wide as a Porsche, no wider, and he went through. Well, that's the kind of moves that a win your race here. That look how that opened up. He was sitting right on the outside of that uh, of that Mercedes. I wonder what he was doing, but I couldn't see ahead. And what he was doing was this. Look at him here, right on the Mercedes. Now there's a car right there. See, it's Cooper, and he dives right through that little hole. Have we just seen the definition of the, of the word decisive? Yeah, watch this, watch this. <laughs> Man, that makes you, that's close. Now let's watch it from Bobby Archer's perspective. He's thinking, ah, he's bottled up, and then he's thinking he's gone. Unbelievable, that's pretty tight racing right there. Real good, gutsy move. And you're right, he's decisive. He didn't, he didn't hesitate, he stuck it right through that hole. I like how you put that. That's the kind of move that'll win your race. And Peter Kitchik just laid down a beauty. And you can see the margin is there. About three, four car lengths already over Archer. Underneath the arch and heading up for turn six. Here at Trois-Rivières, Peter Kitchak has made his mark. And it's a very distinctive one on this race in the early going. And boy, is he pulling away in a hurry. Well, he's lucky so. he didn't make his mark <laughs> else. up against the wall. That was a great pass, and Peter Kitchak leads overall.
Welcome back to the Speed Vision World Challenge Championship. And this race, of course, the combined event. You're looking at the touring cars, the GT machinery also running. There is Michael Galati. And Dorsey, the smoke has dissipated. So perhaps uh, whatever it was that was uh, in contact there, uh, if it's the tire rubber has, uh, has worn away, or I suppose a big bump on this track may have hit the fender and just bent it out, huh? Well, the tire will bend it out, too. If it stays there long enough, it doesn't cut the tire down. The tire will actually roll the fender back away from it. And I think that's what's happened. We don't see any smoke anymore. And that's a good news for Mike Galati because, uh, of course, if he had the tire blow, he could have another accident. And that, by the way, folks, I believe was Klein Newbing sweeping by Fred Meyer, who's the fourth member of this real-time racing team. And uh, they are putting Meyer a lap down. Hugh Plum is now ducking down the inside of Meyer. That is Fred Meyer. And then coming around is Galati. So now the uh, three cars, the two orange and white Acuras and then the white Acura of Galati. That's one, two, three. And then Meyer lapped down. There are your three touring leaders. Well, Meyer had a pretty big accident qualifying, and that car was completely tore up as we came into the racetrack. So these guys did a good job just getting that back out there. He's a lap down, but probably the handling isn't what he'd like to it be. You know, we've talked during the season, we've seen Kleinubing have a couple of incidents where parts of the car are no longer aligned very well, and he seems to have a real gift for being able to drive a car that's not working perfectly very well. Looks like Galati has that same ability. Yeah, you know, if you knock the back end of one of these front-wheel drive cars out, you can still go on pretty good because the front wheel's doing all the work. But uh, if you hurt the front end, on the other hand, then your, your day's pretty much over. Of course, Galati, it looks like he might have bent the rear axle. I think he's okay other than that, though. And Galati's done a little bit of ice racing, so he's used to having a back end that's not exactly stuck. There is your leader, Kitchak, overall, and he has seriously opened up the margin over Archer. Oh! That's Archer and Charlie Downs. In the brake zone, and Archer hadn't cleared Downs' BMW when he got on the brakes, the thing turned over, and they actually hit. It didn't turn over on its roof, but it, it turned into the side of it. Well, that's one of those, of those situations you were talking about. The cars, the, the GT cars, are faster, they carry a lot more speed, so they have to actually brake sooner, and the touring cars can brake later, and sometimes that's what happens. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. The Viper had more speed on, and he thought he had him cleared. Watch right now, he thinks he's clear, and he pulls over. Well, the BMW had better brakes and uh, drove in there. They made contact. Lucky they didn't get turned around backwards right there. And now Bobby Archer starts to try and make his way by Jason Potter and slides through Potter driving the Honda Accord and uh, Bobby Archer makes that pass nicely and Jason Potter giving him a lot of room that performance motorsports machine pretty savvy young driver bit of a revelation this season in the touring car class nobody uh, really figured he'd be a factor and he has been a contender in most of the races Jason Potter doing a nice job working underneath the arch there goes Archer putting the lap down on another of the vets and uh, Boy, he is having a very strong run. His only problem is it's for second. Yeah, and you can't even see the leader right now. Peter Kitchak is really making time in traffic. And like I said earlier, that's something that the Porsche will do because of its good brakes. And also remember, the longer we go green, that the uh, Viper tends to, to run off its brakes a little bit, run off its tires, and the Porsche seems to be pretty strong. You saw right back there, Biscup with a big slide. He's got Pete Halsmer all over him. Yeah, Halsmer has closed it up and is making that interesting. There goes Peter Polly and the Polly Brothers Cutlery entry slide. Where the hell Halsmer come from? <laughs> this guy must have looked in his mirror and had no clue he was there. <laughs> I believe it came from Michigan, <laughs> but he's right there behind you. Halsmer very close indeed, and here we are on board with Biscup, and he is uh, probably paying a lot more attention to his mirrors at this stage of the race as Halsmer putting on some immense pressure as they head down the front straight. There's more lap traffic in front. That could certainly play a role here as this battle between the... Oh, and number 93, Jeff Tarr, and the h &R Springs BMW is looped in turn two. Yep, up at top of turn two. Looks like he's back to the wall pretty good up there with the BMW. And there's the rest of the field. There's Potter and Downs in their battle. And Halsmer looks to the inside. Coming on, they touch. No contact. Oh, boy, they almost hit the bridge abutment. And Biscup gets stuffed into the tires. Halsmer continues. He just nudged the bridge abutment. But Biscup got hit and then got hooked up behind 45 Meyer, who was really caught up in that one just as everybody slid into him. Well, Meyer was already spun out there when they came around the corner. Biscup, of course, had nowhere to go. He locked up and went in there, and he's got pretty good damage, Greg, to the front end of the Porsche. You're looking at it right now. Whole spoiler's gone. Left front's crunched in pretty good. Nope, the steering's out. I'm done. In no business. Try to pass me into in the, uh, in the arch. 
Tough, tough break. Biscuff, as you can uh, hear, he came in here third in the points, and that's going to go down seriously at this stage. There goes Diorio and the rest of the field going by. Dorsey, let's go back and take a look, and there goes Halsman. Halsman down the inside, not clear. They hit right there. Look at Biscuff headed straight for the concrete wall. Good job missing that there, but he collects Meyer, and he puts him into the wall. Now he has nowhere to go and stepped into the tire barrier. And Dorsey, now let's take a look at it from on board. Why is he waving? He's waving to the guys behind him, letting know that there's a car crashing the wall up here, and you can see it. There it is right there. That was a warning for the guys behind him. But now, look, Halsmer's to the inside of him down here. And there's the hit. Oh, <laughs> that was close. As you said, once he spun Meyer after the contact with Halsmer, it literally trapped him up against Meyer. He had nowhere to go, and he's in the pits. George Biscop has pulled his Porsche into his stopping area, and the whole front end of the car is very heavily damaged. Now remember, it's up here, but this all-important cooling uh, system works for the engine. They take on 17 quarts of oil, and that is how the engine is actually cooled. They're having a good look all around the front, but I'll tell you guys, I think they got into the suspension, and I can see the oil dripping. This car has had a rough day out there. Well, obviously, if he's losing oil and it's uh, in some serious quantity, they got into some of the, uh, the oil reservoirs in front. That's not good. Oh, and there's Cooper I pulled off on the side of the road, too, for that matter. Uh, yeah, the oil system's taken out, but you also heard Biscop say that he had lost his steering, so his suspension's bent, and now we look at Peter Kitchik is uh, going... Actually, he didn't make that pass. He didn't get around him. You know why? Because one of the real-time cars had pulled off, and they may have been under a yellow for that corner and there it is number 44 a very tough break for kevin trance out of boulder colorado has pulled over and parked and now they cleared that yellow i think is what happened and now kitchick easily makes the pass yeah that that's a good call for you greg because that was a, a, a yellow right there and of course if he had passed there had been a penalty so he didn't pass so now Kitchak has relatively clear sailing in front. Uh, not a lot of lap traffic for him to work through, and you can see he is stretching that margin out. Oh, we are full course yellow. Full course yellow, and that may be for Schrantz and Cooper, both of whom we have seen pulled off at various stages, and we're full course yellow. And so that big margin that Kitchak had built up over Archer is going to go away. There they are, moving Schrantz back behind the wall, and we will step away for just a minute as well. the Trois Rivières where we continue now to circulate under caution due to Kevin Schrantz and Bill Cooper's wounded cars on circuit and they're trying to clear him off and George Biscop is out of the car and he's with Biz. George before this race you were sitting very relaxed in your garage area all ready to go racing. You're very confident here you are in the pits what happened? Oh we were just going into the uh, arch over there and Pete Halsberg had no business going on the inside of me and he just uh, hit me from behind and I hit the car in front of me to tee touring car but there was no no reason for it obviously pete Halsmer's past his prime you were second in the championship this really hurts you on the point yeah we're running second in the championship and you know these guys are just out there just trying to uh get the car working and we're going for the championship and people get in the way it's just stupid well, the heat of the moment, obviously, George Biscop very, very upset, but it did not look like a well-advised move. Well, it's not a place you would normally go down there. I've been passed on there before. It's pretty awkward, and this time it just didn't work. Well, and as a result, obviously, it has taken both Meyer and Biscop out of the race. Ironically, Pete Halsberg continues to circulate in the Acura NSX. As the field does under yellow, we'll be right back. Catois Riviere, Quebec, Canada. We're looking at the back of the field, and you'll notice Pierre Kleinubing is at the very back of the pack. We're going to go on board with him from just a minute ago in a replay. Listen to the audio. It'll explain what happened. You can hear from the crew's reaction, that was manna from heaven for Pierre Klein to be. Dorsey, that's one of the nuances of multi-class racing, what just happened. Well, what happened was the overall leader, Peter Kitschek, had lapped both um, Galati and Q Plum and had not yet lapped Pierre Klein newbie. And with that, he got up to the pace car. The pace car waves him around and he gets a whole free lap. So now Pierre Klein newbie is at the tail end, almost a full lap up on the full field of the touring cars. And that unfortunately is what can happen in these endurance races like this. But uh, for everybody but him, it's a real bad deal because they're a lap down. But for him, well, he just got a gift. He got a big gift indeed, and uh, that's what happens when the pace car comes out and picks up the leader, and you're in front of the leader. 
perhaps the most important part of all this is unless some miracle were to occur, that would seem to spell an end to Michael Galati's remarkable streak of consecutive wins and the record in this championship that looks to be set and stopping at four. Well, you're right there because, uh, you know, halfway through the race or so, and now you're a lap down, and whole field is a lap down to just one car. All Pierre has to do is stay out there and stay out of trouble, and uh, the likeliness of him being caught a full lap up is pretty slim. Pretty slim indeed, and of course it's not very likely that either Plum or Galati is going to be able to get around the overall GT leader, so that situation is just going to uh, keep itself uh, played out. There's no question of that. So really the battle now in Turing comes down to a battle for second, and uh, the points championship is still important as well, so I mean, Galati's got to still focus. Yeah, he's got to just put it behind him. I mean, there was nothing that he did wrong. He drove the race as good as he could be driving it. It was just uh, bad luck on his part, and that a few plums as well. well. Let's take a look at our Sears race reset in the GT division. There have been two leaders. Archer from pole started off, but then Peter Kitchak with a great pass and then some awesome driving through traffic has led from that point on. And of course, in the touring division, it has been Pierre Kleindubing pretty much all the way with the exception of Galati in the early going. Galati's contact, remember, with the wall is what really perhaps set up the situation that has just developed with the pace car. Well, now, like you said, uh, everybody's it, it turns the whole race around. At least for the turn guys, it turns around. They just now have to race for second place. And the pace car makes his move down into pit lane, and Kitchak is going to bring him around. There is Plum, there's Galati, then Archer. So the leaders in both of the classes make up the top four cars. It's just that it's Kitchak, and then four cars behind is Archer, and the two Turing leaders right in the middle. And I would think the smart thing to do here would be to let Archer just rip by those touring cars. And look at that. He's trying to do it. He's also trying to take a run at Kitchak down into turn one. He's on the outside. And boy, it was a brave move. And look at Galati swinging way wide again. And Kitchak hangs on with Archer second. And boy, they didn't make me look very good there. I thought they just let him go. But of course, Galati wanted to get by Plum as quick as possible. Yeah, he wanted to get back into that second place position if he could. Oh, look at the Viper stepped out almost got in the wall. Archer too hard on the throttle. There's a big bump down there as you come out from under that corner, and it almost spun the car out. Getting a little greedy, recognizing that uh, the way it's been going uh, here for him, he needs to stay with Kitchak as much as possible. Look at on board with Archer. Look at the start. Oh! oh Man, Galati moved over. He had no clue that Archer had that kind of a run. Watch this. Watch the back end. He hits the bump, throttle goes down hard, and he almost gets into the wall there. Boy, a great save by Bobby Archer, a true master of car control. And he is doing everything within his power. And that, I believe, is Tarr, Jeff Tarr. He had had the problem before. We saw him up there crashing in turn two. Now he's around backwards, and that's in the brake zone at the end of the straightaway, which means I'm sure he had a spin and is backed in there. We'll see a replay. Here he is going backwards, and there he is backing in one more time. Not a Boy, good day. Boy, he was, he was spun around well before the uh, apex of that corner. Well, that just that's totally. You still do it. I have faith. You do too. We can do it. That was a conversation between Peter Kitchek and crew. Kitchek not happy with another yellow coming out and his crew going, don't worry about it. You covered him once, we know you can do it again. Yeah, and of course he's talking about uh, about Archer right behind him and the power and the torque of that V10 on the restarts is a bit concerning for the Porsche driver. Well, he certainly got a good run that time as he got around both of those touring cars and almost was able to slide around Kitchak. I suppose Kitchak's a little concerned that he might come uh, streaming up the inside into turn one and uh, actually make one stick. Yeah, you don't want to have that happen. Well, we're out of brakes. I don't know what happened. Well, Bobby Archer concerned. We'll be back with the restart for Archer. Turn one is looming. Welcome back to Trois Rivières, Quebec. The lights are out on the pace car, Dorsey. We're going to be going green, and Kitchik has got a brakeless Bobby Archer behind him with a lot of power going into turn one. Well, Kitchik doesn't know about the brake problem, and I guarantee you that Archer's been pumping with his left foot trying to get a pedal back. We'll see if there's any brakes when he gets to turn one. Well, Archer trying to keep it very close here as the pace car makes its move in. Kitchik, I would think, would like a little quicker start to not let that V10 use its lugging power. And, uh, oh, they come out of turn nine, and Kitchik really hits the binders. I think he wants to be able to get on the throttle do the twisty bits here. And uh, Archer's staying right with them. Right there. Let's see. Watch for it. 
Archer, there's the green. He goes way inside. Oh, and he kicks up a huge cloud. Now he goes outside on board with Dave Sharp. Oh, Boy, how did he not get into Halsman? He almost hit Halsman. They were all in gray. Look at here. They're still in the gray. Boy, three abreast to the exit of one. Now into turn two. There's Kitchik. There is Archer. Then a couple of the Turing machines. There's Halls for now up to third. Safara right behind him. Oh, we've had an accident down here. That's Shark. And Galati. And Galati in a BMW. Oh, that's in turn two. All of them get gathered up, and Shark was running fifth in GT at the time. Galati was running in the top five in Turing. They both have dropped well back. Well, that was turn two, and it stacked up pretty good on him there, that's for sure. Shard now tries to come back. Let's go on board from Shard. He tries inside of Halsman right here. Oh, he got hit. Shard got hit by somebody. Well, wonder who it was. Tommy Safar just slid through. There comes some of the rest of the field. What was Galati trying to do? I had that corner. It was mine. Well, apparently it was Galati, and it was a solid enough hit that it spun that uh, that Toyota around pretty comprehensively. <laughs> it explains who it was, all right. I guess Galati, who was running third in Turing, uh, misjudged the corner. Oh, those six Porsches up into the into the barrier there. Boy, Eric Boisler getting off. That's turn number eight, right at the exit of eight, and up against the barrier on the outside of the track. I think he's hit that. That's concrete over there. He's missed the tire wall. Let's see what happened here. Here he comes, and he's a little loose. It's going to hook. It's going to hook back to the right real hard, and he's locked it down too late, and bam. Yeah, he's into the concrete. It wasn't as hard a hit as it may have uh, looked in the first time, but that is enough, and it does bring out a full course yellow once again here at Trois Rivieres, and Peter Kitschak keeps surviving these restarts and then has to do it all over again. We'll be back. Riviere, the pace car is heading into the pits. We are about to go back to green, and once again, Peter Kitchak is going to have to fend off Archer going into one. Be sharp, be on your toes, and drop the hammer when it's done. Hubby, your race has been short, you got three laps to go. Four and a half minutes left after you get the green. So you hear the communication. Dave Moore talking to his driver, Kitchak, and Bobby Archer's crew telling him about the short race distance. There is the green, and this is the opportunity for Archer. He gets in fast. He gets in hot on the outside. Kitchak protects, and Kitchak holds on. Ooh, both those cars broke loose coming out of turn one. Left big skid marks on the pavement, so the tires aren't up to temp yet. Look at Halsman. Halsmer right there. He has driven a very quiet race except for the contra attempts with Biscup. But right there, he comes out of that. That's a corner where he should really get through it well. And the two lead cars are gone. And Archer trying the outside. Biscup protects. Biscup now under braking. That car excels there. And he comfortably is able to get back and take the quick line, which is key getting out of here. Archer looked to the inside first. Biscup didn't have any of that. I'm sorry. It wasn't Biscup. It was Kitschek. But he had none of that. He moved right over in front of him and then used the Porsche's big brakes, which will help right down here, too. Kitschak, Archer right there, then Halsburg, then Thomas Safar, a great run for him, and another very strong performance by Rick DiOrio. We saw him excel in Lime Rock until mechanical problems hurt him, but Pete Halsburg right now, right in the thick of things. There's Kitschak, Archer, as they slide through turn 10. There is the Acura NSX of Pete Halsburg. Only a couple laps to go right now. Look at Kitschak, really got the Porsche flying right now. Halsmer, of course, if he knew that Archer had brake problems, would really, really be hounding him at the end of the straight. Away. Through turn one and down into turn two. They sweep through here and then underneath the arch. Pretty good braking here. Not too hard of a brake right here, Greg, but when you turn underneath this bridge, of course, it brings you on the long straightaway. The Viper's going to have more top end. That means it's got to get rid of more speed at the other end of the straightaway. Watch up front there. Kitschek is not going to let him have the inside. know that. Kitschek. No doubt, keeping a bit of an eye on the mirrors here. Now he knows he's in good territory, that braking zone. And Archer, for not having any brakes, is pretty impressive under braking. Well, the cautions have helped him out a lot. It's given him time to cool the brakes down and use his foot to pump the pedal back up again. So I think for at least a few laps, he'll be okay. And of course, we're only looking at the, probably the white flag this lap. So the short race, a godsend for Bobby Archer. There is Pierre Kleinubing, who of course has that huge margin in the Turing category, almost up by a lap over the rest of the field. 
and uh, he's enjoying that. Mike Lottie, after that contact with Shard, by the way, had dropped to well out of the top five, so points are a real issue here, and we have some good battling in this touring division. Well, Fly Newbing, of course, look, taking no chances of all those cars in front of him. He's not racing any of them. All he's got to do now is just stay out of trouble for another lap, and he's got this in the bag. A faster GT car comes up, give him room, let him through, and uh, obviously, uh, if he can, keep the pace up at the same time. So Kleine, boy, that BMW that just went through that white one has been sideways in a couple of corners and uh, continues. There's a good look at Klein Ubing. And uh, down into the pits here is number 12. That's Pierre Barai, one of the local favorites. And that uh, is looks like a terminal problem done for the day. Yeah, he's pulling that thing behind the barrier, so his day's over for sure. This is looking out at two, exit two, headed down into the... Archstern. That was a huge move we just saw by Mike Galati. He just went underneath Jason Potter, the previous corner, and has moved back into the top five. So Mike Galati, uh, with a wounded car, is absolutely flying. Of course, this is all for points from Galati. He's, oh, look at that Corvette almost didn't get stuck. And I uh, didn't get stopped and almost got in the tire barrier there. That was Kelly Bradley getting a little loose. And uh, as you said, almost didn't get stopped and almost got stuck. There's a look at Potter again who just lost that position to a, an absolutely determined Galati. There's the white flag. White flag out. Peter Kitchak in the Q8 and Toad Hall Porsche needs to hang on for one more lap. And the longer it goes here, even though in this last lap, really has to play into his hands because one would suspect Archer's brakes have to be fading more and more and more each corner. And the tires. I just saw the Viper do a big power slide off that corner. Watch here. He doesn't get it hooked up totally, but it wasn't that bad there. The Porsche still looks very, very good as far as ability to get off this corner. So there are your two overall race leaders, and you can see they've distanced themselves once again from Halsmer there, just at the back of the frame. That's the margin they have opened up, so it really has been these two from the get-go. There was the big power slide by the Viper. You saw it that time as he couldn't get the power down. Now, there's no real good passing opportunities all the way down through here. Of course, it gets to the tightest two or three corners leading onto the front straightaway. This next little sequence right here. Archer would have to come from a long way back to make any kind of an attempt anyway, although he has closed it up a little bit. Last time through the hairpin, turn nine. Nice wide exit. The crew getting ready and watching for their driver coming through turn 10. And there it is, Peter Kitchak onto the front straight, leading Archer across, and that is Peter Kitchak's second win of the year. All right! I think they are pretty pleased, and boy, they sure should be. There's Halsmer for third, and right back there, you can see Tommy Safar coming around, going to pick up a very strong finish in fourth. There's the touring cars. There is Klein Ubing, and that number 65 behind him, Walter Marks, very crossed up, and boom, and he got into the wall, saves it, didn't hit it that hard, and saves it. But there is Klein Ubing, one last turn, and he is going to swing onto the front straight, and he is very happy as well. You can see him pumping his fist in the cockpit. And so your winner is Kitchak and Klein Ubing. And mentioning Klein Ubing as a winner, Galati Streak stops at four. Well, I tell you what, Klein Ubing got the break of a lifetime today. It gave him a brand new uh, one-lap lead on the field, took all the pressure off. Of course, there's the celebration. We're on board. Watch what happens here to Walter Marks. He looks like he just turned in early and got a bunch of understeer. I got big understeer there and just went right on out there and hit that wall. But he's able to hang on and works his way through the final couple of corners. All the runs a little wide there as well. May have messed up the front end a little bit, but he tracks through and he takes the finish. We'll be back at Trois Rivieres to visit with our winners. Peter Kitchak, congratulations on a great win. That Porsche was working just the way you said it was. It really went well. You know, we had to win the race about four times with the restarts, uh, but the car worked well, and as long as we could stay ahead of Bobby Archer and get out of the first turn ahead of him, we had a nice race going. The car worked beautifully. Car worked beautifully indeed. So Peter Kitchak gets his second win of the year over Bobby Archer. Pete Halsmer, a great run to third. Tommy Safar, an awesome run to fourth. And Dave Shart, after the problems, rebounds to fifth. Rick DiOrio. Then the two teammates, Kelly Bradley and Terry Lackey, run seventh and eighth. Ninth to Fernand LeBlanc. And in tenth, it was Peter Polly. Let's go down with Biz and our second place finisher. Bobby Archer, a great second place finish, but that Porsche was all over you. Well, we thought it would be really close. I just couldn't get any brakes in traffic. You know, I lost the lead on the restart with one of those touring cars, and the guy just wouldn't get out of my way. And then the lap later, I got ran off the track, and then on the next restart, I got blocked. So, you know, we just did the best we could, and we still got a good car, and we're ready for the Grand Rapids. 
Well, in the point standings, Bobby Archer leads Peter Kitchick, George Biscop third, Bill Cooper, and David Sharp. Manufacturers, Porsche takes the lead from Dodge, Chevrolet, BMW, and Acura. Down in the pits, John Bisignano has the winner in Turing. Pierre, you've been waiting for this one. Congratulations on your first win of the season. Yeah, that was awesome. You know, my team worked so hard this weekend. As usual, we improved the car during sessions. We improved the car once a second from the first session to the qualifying. We even improved and even bow more after qualifying. And the car was awesome to the race. I passed Michael, I, I think, by four lap and just started pulling away. And uh, I got a big break to the yellow flag when the yellow came came I, you know I got a lap on the field and uh, real time did it again you know it's an awesome team it was about time well real time racing's preparation never in doubt you add in the luck of the draw with the pace car and a huge win for Pierre Klein moving a 1-2 finish with Hugh Plum in second Charlie Downs a great run to third Michael Lotti what a comeback to fourth salvaging some points Jason Potter youngster continues to impress Ellinger Wade Marks Stewart and Trahan round out the top 10 and back down in pit lane John Bisignano has found Mike Lotti the second we start, I mean, this guy's, they parking in the front straight away. You know, here we go. You know, we got a 180 horsepower, 200 horsepower against 600 horsepower cars. They don't want us to stay in line. I mean, that's outrageous. I mean, that was the worst start I ever seen. So we go down in turn one. I got a Corvette on the left, a Toyota Supra on the right. I'm in the middle. We go to one, we go to two. All of a sudden, they both want to, what I was, they want the Toyota and the Corvette, they wanted a piece of real estate. So they turn both like this. I had no place to go. That's what happened when the, the two classes are running together. Well, in the point standings, Michael Gladi leads Pierre Klein, Newbing. Hugh Plum is third, Alfred DuPont fourth, and Brian Wade top five. In manufacturers, all Acura, BMW in second, Honda's third, and Mercedes-Benz fourth. Absolutely, Doris, a great weekend of racing here. We want you to join us next time from Grand Rapids. You thought this track was awesome, and Kitschek making the move for the win here. Grand Rapids, an awesome race as well. And they will be separate events. Don't miss it. Once again, for Dorsey Schrader and John Bisignano, I'm Greg Creamer. We'll see you next time for the Speed Vision World Challenge Championship. Take care.